on to real science now. So I'm going to be talking to you today about repeat instability as a basis for human disease as well as a potential target for therapy. And when I say potential target for therapy, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to draw attention, your attention, to how we might be able to attack this at the DNA level. We're not there yet and I will mention to you some areas where people are actually attacking these diseases. Um, so it's early days yet. So I'll be giving my talk in two sessions. Um, I'll be giving an introduction uh, part and I'll be giving treatment avenues. Specifically what I'll be talking about in the treatment avenues is I'll be talking about um, what we should be looking at. Specifically we should be looking at where instability occurs, when instability occurs, how and what it is. Um, these are important things to know because it tells you if you're going to treat, where you should treat and when you should treat. And it also tells you what you should be attacking. So I'm going to start off with my introduction. Um, there are 40 diseases that are caused by unstable repeat sequences. Um, and there's some controversy about what the number is. If you want to know what that number is and what those particular <coughs> disease genes are, I, I suggest you to go to uh, a recent review that we published and there are several um, encyclopedic um, tables in the supplementary information there with all those diseases listed. The instability at these uh, various uh, diseases is locus specific occurring in particular genes so it's not genome wide instability that we're talking about here. Um, the repeat length is uh, going to determine what the instability is like and the instability is tissue specific as well as J is dependent in many of these diseases. So if we think about um, the genome as though it were written in three letter words, which in fact it is, um, you would have genes that are like sentences and a sentence could be the cat ate the fat fat rat. So the mutations that we're all familiar with are things like base changes, insertions, deletions, etc. and they make spelling mistakes and these are stably transmitted again and again in the same way. And the spelling mistakes could be the gat ate the fat fat rat. What is a gat and does it eat fat rats? Um, whereas in the case of trinucleotide repeat instability, the mutation is a triplet repeat that's expanding it again and again. And so this mutation, unlike these mutations, this one is dynamic. It continues to change and it changes by transmission as well as in somatic tissues of the individual and it gets fatter and fatter and fatter. So the research that's ongoing in my lab is actually trying to figure out what exactly made that cat so hungry or the rat get so fat. And essentially we want to put this animal onto a diet and keep this one from eating too much. So the diseases um, are 40, but I will be focusing upon two diseases. I'll be talking a little bit about spinal cerebral ataxia type 7. And I will be focusing most of my talk on myotonic dystrophy type 1. And you can see that in uh, the DMPK gene there is, in the um, untranslated region, there is a population of sizes that are in the non-affected individuals and these are stably transmitted so there are no mutations occurring in these alleles. And then there's a genetically unstable uh, range which is what we call a pre or protomutation length. And we call it protomutation because sometimes these individuals eventually do get disease as they age but when they're actually diagnosed they don't actually have disease. And in the uh, disease population there is a range and you can see I've recently changed this and I have to change it again because it keeps getting bigger um, from the analysis that we're doing and I'll show you some of that work. And these are genetically very unstable lengths um, and they're associated with many disease symptoms. Um, so these diseases, many of them show what's called genetic anticipation. So this is non-Mendelian inheritance pattern of a genetic trait. And so what I'm showing you here is the pedigree. As you go through multiple generations, um, you see um, that the disease severity actually increases as you go through the family. So a grandchild could be very sick compared to the grandparents um, who might not even know that they have a disease. Um, and as you go through the pedigree, you see that the age of onset also decreases. So you can see the disease in this child at a very young age compared to their parents or their grandparents. Um, and this genetic anticipation has been actually uh, shown to be correlated to the repeat length. And as you go through the generation, you look at the, you track the chromosome, you see that the repeat's getting bigger and bigger as you go. So that's 
through transmission. So what's actually happening at these diseases and what can we use as, what can we see as targets? So in myotonic dystrophy, a lot is known. So we know that we have this um, genetically stable length and on an evolutionary scale, there must have been some sort of mutations occurring at the repeat tract that enlarged the repeat tract to an unstable length and that then became genetically more unstable. And so there is expansions <coughs> occurring in the germline as well as in the tissues of the patients. And when this is expanded, you have problems with transcription. So the transcription levels of that expansion are altered. <coughs> and the production of the transcript uh, yields a transcript that's got a expanded repeat in it, a toxic CUG repeat. And there's also now evidence for uh, transcription of the antisense, and it's also producing an expanded transcript. The actual pathogenic role of this is still not clear. It's not known if it has any um, pathogenesis uh, in the disease. There is some suggestion that it does, though. Um, so when you express this toxic RNA, you have altered expression of some RNA binding proteins. And there's links of that to pathogenesis. You also have other RNA binding proteins, which are bound up here and essentially sequestered away from their uh, cytoplasmic location and that gives rise to a whole bunch of other downstream defects and so that occurs. You can also have aberrant processing of the toxic RNA itself and all of these effects here can have many downstream effects both upon nuclear foci localization of proteins, expression of proteins as well as processing of a, a whole gamut of different gene transcripts um, because these are uh, RNA uh, processing enzymes. And so there's all of this and then there's many, many downstream symptoms that are associated with myotonic dystrophy. It's probably one of the most complex uh, series of symptoms for a single uh, genetic disease. So what are the targets that we can look at? Well, we know that we have this expansion that's occurring um, both between parents and their offspring as well as in tissues. So we could attack that. We could actually hope for not just a stopping the expansion, but maybe reversing it from an expansion to a normal size in, uh, a repeat track in the uh, individual. The other thing we could do is we could attack these processes as well as these processes by working on the DNA in flanking sequences because there's evidence, and as I'll be showing you, uh, for cis-acting as well as trans-acting factors in those regions. Another thing that one might think about doing is by attacking um, the aberrant production of this uh, toxic CUG. You could actually say, hey, let's, process, let's produce the normal allele, but not the disease allele, and then we won't have this toxic RNA, and you won't have any of the downstream uh, effects. And you could also, if we find that this is also pathogenic, we could attack this as well. Another thing we could do is say, hey, we are not able to attack the production of this, but what we are able to do is attack this itself, and we could specifically degrade this and then uh, you know, obviate all these downstream problems. Another thing we might think about doing is by upregulating um, the proteins whose regulation are aberrant, and this has actually been done in mice um, by Maurice Swanson. Um, you might also think about doing um, uh, upregulation of this protein because this protein, uh, this series of muscle blind proteins are sequestered away so they're essentially loss of function by this toxic gain of function so if you upregulate these um, that might actually help and that's been done in mice also by Maurice Swanson. Um, you might at attack the processing, <coughs> you might also attack this sequestration, the interaction of these proteins with the toxic RNA. If you can actually obviate that maybe you'll obviate symptoms and that's been done by several groups, um, most uh, wonderfully by Charles Thornton. He, sh he published a paper in, I think it was July this, uh, this past year, um, showing that you can actually uh, in disrupt this interaction by uh, morpholinos and actually uh, relieve the mice of myotonia. Um, so this can also be an obvious uh, pathway to treat. Um, and then you can choose any one of your favorite symptoms and treat them individually. Um, so looking at this, this is what we know. There's probably an equal 
amount or more of things that we don't know. If you believe that, as the field does, that many of the problems in myotonic dystrophy patients are caused by all of the genes that are misspliced because of this, then attacking this process should actually do everything that you want it to do. Um, however, there's probably more to the story than we actually know at this point in time. And so if all of the things aren't due to this, attacking this will not uh, provide uh, assistance or aid to all of the things that we would like to treat. However, treating this would take care of all of this. And so my lab and other labs are persisting to look at trying to treat that. So we're thinking that this is actually a way to um, look at this, and I stress that this is progress in this area. So where is instability occurring and when is it occurring is actually a very good question. And there's some in, uh, evidence in the literature uh, about this, but it's not very carefully done and it's not been done in a systematic uh, way. So what I'm showing you here is an overview of repeat instability uh, occurring. And it's not known by a lot of people um, that there are also contractions because these are expansion bias mutations. But there are in fact contractions. So this, this overview shows on the outside circle all of the arrows are the expansions that are occurring. And in the inside circle all of the arrows are the contractions. And so contractions are actually naturally occurring in uh, these diseases. In the case of uh, Fragile X, Friedrich's ataxia or SCA8, there are massive contractions of the expanded repeat down almost sometimes to the normal range. And this occurs in the paternal um, uh, germline of these uh, families. And so there are contractions occurring there. And so why, why is that interesting to me? That's interesting to me because that's a naturally occurring phenomenon. If we could understand the biology and the genetics behind that naturally occurring phenomenon, maybe we could harness that process to occur in tissues, let's say for the brain or for the heart or the muscle, and make those expansions contract. Um, so those things are places that one might look at. There are contractions, I've, I've, as I've indicated, that are evolutionary occurring on the normal allele, and we have yet to detect these. Um, and then there are the unstable links which um, give rise to expansions, which give rise to disease. And if we understand how these expansions are occurring, as well as the larger expansions, um, we might be able to attack those processes, either by stopping them or by reversing them. And some of the things are actually listed there, and I'll be covering some of those. So we know that there are uh, expansions occurring by paternal transmission, and those are occurring in the spermatogonia. And we know that there are expansions also occurring uh, by maternal transmission occurring in the oogonia. But what we're mostly interested in is actually how to treat the expansions that are occurring in different tissues. And so it's known for many of these diseases, but not all, that there is um, ongoing expansions occurring in different tissues. And in many cases, the expansions are occurring in the affected tissues or in the affected cell types. So there is somatic instability in the case of myotonic dystrophy in Huntington's. Um, and this is high levels of length change occurring. Uh, and these length changes are age dependent. The pattern is actually tissue specific. And the pattern of instability, both the degree and the frequency and the, the magnitude of changes, uh, as well as the tissue specificity, varies from disease to disease. Um, so for Huntington's, it's predominantly in the brain, whereas in myotonic dystrophy, as I will show you, it's also in the brain, but it's in the heart and the muscle as well. And I ask, is there methylation differences? And I'll be telling you why I'm interested in that. So the disease symptoms are actually tissue specific. And the symptoms are progressive through the life of the individual. Um, and since somatic expansions are in affected tissues and progress through the life of the individual, these actually um, seem to be uh, appropriate uh, therapeutic targets to us. So in the case of muscular dystrophy, um, what we're covering here is that there is instability occurring in the brain, the heart, um, and the blood, um, and the muscle, um, and clearly in the testes. Um, and I've um, updated this by showing some of the numbers, what we know, I know they are. In the case of fetal samples, we know that there can be fairly large differences in the repeat length of the same fetus between different tissues, and I'll show you that um, data in a minute. Um, and we also know that the, those length differences can actually be considerably larger in adults. 
But there's little, little known of this tissue specific instability about how it occurs and what it really is. So understanding this is going to be actually crucial to being able to understand pathogenesis. So there's a mouse model out there which has a very large human uh, region of the DM1 locus integrated into the mouse and that was produced by Genevieve Gourdon and what we're showing here is different tissues from the same mouse aged at five months and PCR amplification across the repeat and run on a gel so you can see the varying sizes of the repeats um, differ between different tissues of the same mouse and this is somatic instability because the mouse actually inherits only one allele size from the gamete of the transmitting parent so this must be somatic instability and it's clearly age dependent so if you take a mouse from the same litter that's lived 18 months you can see that the degree of instability has increased and the pattern of increase is considerably different between different tissues so what's happening in humans so in collaboration with uh, David Chidiat we obtained a series of um, fetal terminations um, and in collaboration with Charles Thornton uh, Masayuki in his lab devised a new way uh, and very sensitive way to look at the size of the repeats in uh, uh, expanded tissues and basically what I'm showing you here is two of the fetuses that we've looked at and we're looking at kidney, liver, muscle, heart, brain, skin, pancreas and we have other tissues that we've looked at and you can see that by electrophoresis there are distinct bands um, with the repeat um, expanded and the repeat expansion number is shown here and you can see that between all of the uh, fetuses that we've looked at, and I'm only showing you two here, but the ones that we've looked at, the liver has uh, the shortest expansion, whereas the heart has the larger expansion. And the difference in size is not that great. Um, and it increases between this is a 14-week fetus and this is a 19-week uh, fetus. Um, but there are distinct uh, band sizes, and that's important. When we looked at... Uh, adult patient tissues, and this is both juvenile and adult onset, um, and this is a, a series of um, autopsies which were provided to us uh, in collaboration with Charles Thornton, um, and you can see right away that the banding pattern here is very smeary for all of the tissues that we've looked at except for um, the cerebellum, um, which oftentimes gives a single or a series of single distinct bands. Um, and we have very large ranging sizes because of these smears and that's indicative of multiple sizes within the tissue. Um, and so that says that between different tissues you can have different sizes. However, between different regions of the same tissue you can also have uh, different sizes. So this is all uh, samples from the same patient and what I'm showing you here is multiple PCR reactions across the repeat um, from the white matter of a brain uh, and the brain in the white matter there is a 15 uh, to 1 ratio of non-neural to neural uh, cells um, or the gray matter of the brain where there is about 1.5 to 1 ratio of non-neural to neural uh, cells and you can see that there is high degrees of instability in the white as well as the gray and it's much higher in the gray whereas the blood there is instability but it's not as much as it is in the other uh, neural tissues. The normal allele in this individual does not change at all. <coughs> so this is a very small part of a very large table uh, of our analyses of the sizes in different tissues and you can see um, we're looking at um, a non-affected fetal tissue here 14 weeks and they have 13 uh, repeats in each allele and it doesn't change between any of the tissues. Um, however, in a 14-week fetus, and we're not sure if it's congenital or um, uh, classical because you can only tell if it's congenital after birth, right? You, know, you have to have a clinical diagnosis. Um, between the different tissues, you can see that the heart has the largest size, whereas the liver has the smallest size. And again, as you age in the fetus, you have larger differences, but it's still consistently the heart is the largest and the liver is the smallest expansion size. So in the um, adult tissues, um, what we did is we looked at the range of the smear and by densimetric peak analysis we found that the most predominant band was what we call here in the brackets. And so there is a large range of sizes within given tissues. Um, but consistently um, the heart has the larger um, expansion size occurring uh, in multiple, um, multiple adults. And the, unlike the liver in the um, 
fetal samples, it is the cerebellum that is the shortest expansion size in the adults. So one way that we can look at this um, instability is by looking at the length difference between tissues within a given individual. So the length difference is shown here and what we've done is we've graphed it relative to the largest size being the heart and what is the length difference between different tissues of the repeat. And so you can see the heart is the largest and the largest repeat length difference is between the liver which is the shortest. So you can see that there is a consistent pattern between different fetuses for the largest and the smallest. Um, and you can see that the degree of instability changes when you age um, the um, fetus. So what's happening in um, adults? Uh, again, what we've done is we've normalized relative to the largest <coughs> and the shortest. And you can see that here and here we're having the, the largest being in the heart and the smallest being the cerebellum. Um, and there's a consistent pattern between different adults. But you'll notice that here the liver relative to the muscle and the heart has actually shifted positions. The liver used to be way over here. So this tells you that in addition to tissue specific patterns of instability uh, and age dependent rates of change, it also tells you that the rate change varies for different tissues between different ages. Okay, so <clears throat> this tells you that during fetal development there is an expansion rate occurring in different tissues and after birth that expansion rate increases and for some tissues it increases greater than others. For example the liver there's very little levels of expansions occurring. It is occurring but it occurs at a greater rate in the adult. However in the fetus and in the adult the expansion rate in the heart is consistently the largest. So what about how and what about what is actually contributing to repeat instability. So I'm going to be giving you an overview of some published material as well as giving you a whole bunch of unpublished material. Excuse me if I talk too fast for you. If, I'm, if I go over something that you, you want me to go over again, stop me, okay? <clears throat> so there are a variety of things that metabolize the DNA and a lot of these have been considered by various labs working on various systems and so far uh, DNA replication and DNA repair seem to be uh, the rulers of repeat instability. Recombination seems to be uh, having a very minor contribution. In fact, most of the uh, mouse data says that recombination is actually not contributing. Um, there's some evidence about transcription um, that it's contributing. However, its contribution is much less than that of DNA replication and repair. And there's a long thought of contribution of cis elements and there's actually only data for one of those that's recently been identified and that would be CTCF and I'll be telling you about that. Um, and there's some thought that replication origins might be contributing to repeat instability and I'll be telling you about that and methylation as well. So um, there's some of the strongest data for repair is coming from mice and so I'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, mismatch repair genes, MSH2, 3 and PMS2 um, as well as some oxidative damage genes including OGG1 seem to be required, strangely enough, required for the mutations of triplet repeats. So let me tell you a little bit about mismatch repair because the effect of mismatch repair genes is striking relative to the contribution of OGG1 which is a little bit milder uh, of an effect. So mismatch repair genes, what's known of those? So mismatch repair genes are basically exactly that. They recognize mispaired DNA and they say, oh, there's a mistake here, there's a bump in the road, let's fix that and keep this be from becoming a mutation. So essentially there are two major complexes, uh, MSH2, MSH6, and MSH2 and 3. The MSH2-6 recognizes base-base mismatches as well as unpaired loop DNA, like what could occur within a dinucleotide repeat. And it actually recognizes and calls in the repair system and says, hey, fix this. And that's what happens. And so you would correct those unpaired DNAs. And MSH2-3 is thought uh, to be involved in the repair of loop DNA. And so it has overlap with this. Um, we know a lot about this in uh, various systems because it's academically a very interesting biochemistry uh, path to follow, but we also know that um, when you mutate these genes um, in humans or in mice, you have a high uh, predisposition for uh, kind of cancer. It's called hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. Boy, is that a long name. Let's shorten it to HNPCC. 
So this HNPCC, individuals are born with a single mutation, predominantly MSH2, MLH1, or MSH6. And they get a secondary hit in the other allele, and they now have high levels of cancer occurring. So in either of these genes, you're going to knock out both these complexes, and you're going to have genome-wide instability, because mismatches and loops are going to occur, and they're not going to be repaired, and that's bad for the genome, and that gives rise to cancer. So the conclusion from the data there tells you right away that if you knock any of those down or use them as a target to treat repeat diseases, you're actually going to predispose the individual to high levels of genome instability and possibly even cancer. So that would not be a good idea. Um, in the case of MSH3, there are no individuals who actually have cancer because of a mutation in this gene. In fact, we haven't detected anybody with a mutation in this gene yet. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that it hasn't been found yet. It doesn't predispose to cancer. Mice have been made with this, and it has very little effect upon mutation levels, um, and it doesn't predispose them to cancer. So that means that if you're going to actually use this as a target, it won't give rise to cancer, which would actually be a good idea. So what's happening with triplet repeat instability and these um, genes? So I'm actually summarizing a lot of labs' work in a few slides here, uh, but it's all published work. Um, so essentially, we know that in mice with expanded repeats, um, they give rise to uh, an expansion bias that's occurring during transmission as well as in tissues. And these mice are wild type for all of these repair genes. However, when you mutate MSH6, nothing seems to happen. So that tells you that MSH6, and possibly this whole complex, is not really important for repeat instability. However, when you knock out MSH2, that actually knocks out both of these protein complexes. And that tells you that MSH2 is important for expansions. These mice still experience repeat instability, but instead of incurring 90% expansions, these mice now incur 90% contractions of the repeat. And that's both during transmission as well as in somatic tissue. So this tells you that this protein and possibly this complex is important for not only mediating expansions, but also protecting against contractions. So MSH2 is required for these. If you knock out MSH3 in mice that have expanded repeats, again, you go from 90% expansions to 90% contractions. So it tells you that it's probably this complex, and pr most importantly, in uh, involving both these proteins. So um, for triplet repeats, MSH2 and 3 are actually required for the expansions, and they might also be required for protecting against contractions of the repeats. So MSH3 is actually a good therapeutic target um, and unlike MSH2, the ablation of MSH3 would not predispose the individual to cancer, making MS3, MSH3 an excellent therapeutic target for triplet repeat diseases. <coughs> so a good question to ask is, what exactly is MSH2-3 doing in the expansion uh, or protection of contractions of triplet repeats? An answer to this would give us great power and insight of how to actually attack this as a therapeutic target. But the unfortunate problem is there's no known function for MSH3. In fact, there's very little known about what MSH3 does because most of the cancer world has stopped working on MSH3 because it doesn't give rise to cancer. So there's no money there to do the research. In fact, the most striking phenomenon associated with MSH3 is the instability of triplet repeats. Um, so a good question to ask is, are mismatch repair proteins required to process slipped strand DNAs formed by these uh, repeats? Um, and th might this repair actually be error prone? So my lab worked very hard um, at establishing an in vitro repair assay to look at slipped strand DNAs formed by these repeats, and that was published. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a very quick overview of a very large study. Um, so what is slipped strand DNAs? I went over that really quickly. So I'll give you what I teach to my students. If you think of DNA, as though it's got two strands, Watson and Crick, and those two strands are the two halves of a zipper. Sometimes, in unstable genes, you actually have problems when you're putting the, the DNA together. Here, the DNA has come together nice and well paired, but sometimes you get these mispairs, these jams in your genes, um, and your, your zipper can be unpaired both in one strand, 
but it can also be unpaired in the other strand. And sometimes the unpairing that occurs is actually different between the two strands. What you really want is you want a repair system that actually will fix that and make your zipper come together nice and clear. So slip strand DNAs are actually out of register mispairings between the two strands at a repetitive sequence. So years ago my lab actually characterized these things forming in um, triplet repeat sequences and basically we've established this assay and we know that if you look at either of the four strands at a replication fork, you could slip any one of those four and depending upon whether you're slipping a nicked strand or a non-nicked strand, you could have <coughs> expansion intermediates or you could have contraction intermediates. And that could be either a CTG or a CAG strand. Similarly, at non-replicating DNA, if you have a damage in the DNA, but there's no replication, during repair of that you're going to have a nick. And again, slippage of either of those four strands you can give rise to contraction or expansion intermediates. And similarly, at recombination intermediates, again, you could have the production of these slip strand DNAs by slippage of either of these strands. So what we did is we established an assay that looked at these, and I'm going to summarize that whole paper right here for you. Essentially, we saw three types of repair uh, pathways. We saw correct repair, where the slip out was actually properly corrected to what you would want, and you get the fully uh, duplex DNA with the right number of repeats or at escape repair. Escape repair means nothing happens to that DNA. It completely gets ignored. And that's actually bad because if there is a slip out and that gets ignored, then it can give rise to a mutation, either expansion or contraction. But we also observed something that was kind of strange and a surprise. We saw error prone repair where there were attempts to repair this um, and the excision of the excess number of repeats was sometimes incomplete, leaving some of the repair products with an excess amount of repeats. So this error prone repair could give rise to repeat instability. Um, so the question we were asking is, are repair proteins required? So there's an awful lot of data here in all of these graphs, but we look at multiple substrates and I'll tell you the take home message here is, here's repair competent cells and we get a uh, efficiency of repair shown here, but when you look at either mismatch repair MSH2 or MSH3 knockouts, um, or various uh, nucleotide excision repair uh, knockouts, you see exactly the same repair pattern. So this is for a slip out of excess 20 repeats. So the slip out has 20 repeats. And it doesn't appear that these proteins are actually required for escape repair, error prone repair, or correct repair. So we still haven't figured out what mismatch repair is doing. We're still working very hard trying to figure that out. So, the differences in repair proteins can't explain tissue-specific or age-dependent instability yet. So the questions that we're asking uh, is, might a mark at the locus be responsible for the tissue-specific and age-dependent instability? And might we be looking at the right or uh, uh, the proper slip DNA? And so we're looking at that right now. So uh, onto cis elements. So cis elements that might mark the DNA for a particular pattern of instability, it's long been thought that there might be a contribution of some cis element, and that would be something in the flanking sequence that's act actually acting to destabilize this repeat sequence. Um, and it's been long thought to exist because of the differences of instability between different loci. Um, so with Alaspata, we did a study to ask about cis elements, and we did this with the SCA7 mouse that Al devised. Uh, and essentially I'll be covering that really quickly here. So Al made with exons 3 and 4 from humans with 92 repeats, CAG, um, he made a mouse and this showed an expansion bias in transmission as well as in tissues of that mouse. Um, however, when he made a mouse which still contained the repeat but the flanking region 8.3 KB was deleted, he found that this actually produced a mouse that was with a stable repeat. So it was stable both in transmissions as well as in tissues. That tells you that something in this 8.3 KB region is actually required to drive the instability of this repeat. So what's in that region? Well, that's a huge region to look at. So what should we focus on? There's a bunch of things, including p uh, potential replication origin sequences, um, CPG islands, and there's this thing called CTCF. What is CTCF? Well, CTCF was shown by Steve Tapscott's group to actually have binding sites both uh, on either side of various triplet repeat sequences or sometimes just on one side. 
and those included myotonic dystrophy, SCA7, DRPLA, SCA2, Huntington's disease, and now more recently Fragile X and Friedrich's ataxia. Um, so we decided we'll look at the CTCF uh, binding site. So what is CTCF? I put right up here a little Swiss Army knife because CTCF is a Swiss Army knife of proteins. It does many things. And I'm sure if we look at it long enough, it'll do lots of things, including the dishes if we wanted it to, I think. It does lots of things. It does gene activation, repression, silencing, chromatin insulation, methylation insulation, imprinting effects. It does DNA structure. Um, importantly, at the myotonic dystrophy locus, it's been shown to actually act as a methylation-sensitive insulator. And it also has antisense transcription regulation uh, as well as chromatin regulation at the myotonic dystrophy locus. And um, we've shown that it actually is a cis element in instability in SCA7 mice. So how do we do that? Well, we know that these mice actually are stable for the repeat, <coughs> and these ones are unstable. And here are our CTCF sites. Well, if this is deleted here, what if we made a mouse that was using this construct but mutant for the CTCF site? Well, we definitely had an effect, however, it wasn't the one we expected. Instead of getting stabilization, we actually saw hyperinstability. So the level of instability in this mouse was much higher than in this mouse. That tells you that this CTCF binding site, which is mutated and not allowing CTCF to bind, is actually required to protect against high levels of instability. So that actually tells you. Um, oh, so we also found that in some of these mice, some of the tissues displayed very high levels of instability. So we predicted maybe it's actually going to be mutated uh, in that tissue. But actually what we found is it wasn't mutated, it was methylated. And methylation actually ablated DNA binding by CTCF at that locus. So it tells you that CTCF binding is actually going to be important. If you ablate it either by mutation or methylation, you're going to give rise to high levels of instability. So this tells us that CTCF binding site at the SCA7 locus actually uh, is a cis element that protects against hyperinstability. It also tells you that the CTCF protein, which binds to that site, is the trans element that mediates the activity of that cis element. And it tells you that CPG methylation of that site is the modifier of the interaction of this protein with the cis element. So it also tells you that CTCF binding sites is not the only thing. Because remember, when we deleted 8.3 KB, the mouse went from being unstable to stable. So there must be something in that 8.3 KB region that is actually driving the instability. So um, questions that we might ask is, how is CTCF regulating instability? Because CTCF looks like it could be, or the binding sites, could be a good target for therapy. Because um, if we can modulate the instability like that, it might be a good thing to look at. So how is that actually working? If CTCF protects against instability, what's actually driving instability? Maybe it's a replication origin. So my lab has been looking at replication origins. I thought that I was going to leave that world, but I actually found myself getting deeper and deeper into it after my PhD. So there are three models of how replication might contribute to repeat instability. And I'm going to be going over those really quickly for you. Um, initially, when people tried to clone these things, into plasmids, they found that they cloned in only one orientation. And when you forced the orientation to clone in the other direction, what happened is you had high levels of contraction of the repeats. They were very unstable in bacteria. So that suggested that replication switch, an origin switch model. And essentially, you could have the repeat track here where this replication origin is occurring, it's activating in the disease individual, whereas in normal individuals, this is the one that's active. And it's unstable versus stable. Alternately, you could have in unstable developmental periods or unstable tissues, you could have this one that's active and in stable pimes or in stable tissues, this one that's active. So that's the origin switch model. When you change the direction of replication by changing the origin that's activated, you change which strand serves as a lagging strand template. So in this direction, CAG is the lagging strand template. And in this case, CTG is the lagging strand template. And that's actually important because different structures can form by CTG or CAG repeats. So if you remember my gene analogy for slip DNAs, different structures can form. In the case of the CAG, it's a loop structure. In the case of the CTG, it's a hairpin structure. So there's another model that's called the ORI shift <laughs> model. Essentially, origins are activated on the same side, so replication direction is going to proceed through the repeat the same way, but you'll have activation at different 
uh, locations during either between disease and non-disease individuals or between unstable times or unstable tissues. Um, and there's another model which is a little more complicated and it's called the fork shift model. Essentially you're having the same replication origin that's activated but something is changing between the initiation site and the repeat, possibly chromatin packaging or the binding of, the, of a protein that's affecting replication fork progression that's changing its instability. And this might vary between non-affected and affected individuals or it might change between unstable times of development or uh, unstable and stable tissues. So these are really great models but let's ask a more important question. What's happening in patient chromosomes with this disease? What's actually occurring in tissues that are showing repeat instability? or what's happening during unstable uh, developmental periods where the repeat is uh, giving rise to expansion. So we initially started this project using patient cells um, looking at fetal fibroblasts that were grown in culture um, and um, I, I probably don't have to go over all of this for you but if you're looking for replication origin, uh, Moro Giacca devised this wonderful method that we took advantage of. Basically if this is our chromosomal region that's our putative replication origin you should have nascent DNA that centers over this origin and some of it's going to have RNA primers and some of it's just going to be sheer DNA. We'll get rid of that by treating with lambda exo and now we have a population there. If it's over replication origin we should have an enrichment over this region by PCR amplification and reduced levels as we proceed out from the replication fork which presumably is asymmetrically growing from the initiation site. So that's our method of analysis and John Clear in my lab looked at the DM1 locus which is 45 KB of region and I'm showing you that here. Um, here's the repeat, here are the CTCF sites, here are the different genes, this is the DMPK, the different directions of transcription that are occurring um, and basically John created a variety of amplicons across this region and he asked what's the replication um, pattern occurring in these uh, patient cell lines. And so what I'm showing you here, and I'll show it in all of my graphs, basically the x-axis represents at a um, scale level the <coughs> genomic region of the DM1 region and the y-axis shows the relative abundance of nascent DNA. And you can see, um, actually it's kind of funny, initially when we produced this we ended up with one massive peak and then I said to John, how about producing some more primer sets in there and we ended up getting this valley which suggests that there are actually two replication origins that are separating on the, uh, from the repeat by CTCF binding sites. So it tells us that we have two replication initiation sites over this um, locus. Um, but there's a problem here. So we actually have two origins flanking the repeat and they're separated by CTCF sites but there's actually two alleles. So the DM1 repeat is actually on chromosome 19. There are two chromosome 19s. So what's actually happening here? So if we think of the different possibilities, one chromosome could have two replication origins that are active and the other chromosome could have two replication origins that are active. Alternately, the disease chromosome could have only this one that's active <coughs> and the non-disease could have this one act that's active. And when we look at the population of the two of them, we end up with two peaks. But we don't know which ones they are. So what we really need to do is we need to look at one allele. So how do we do that? Well, I contacted all my colleagues and I looked in the literature asking people, please, please, do you have a patient who is very unfortunate enough to have uh, expansions in both alleles? There have been reports and they're, they're relatively small expansions um, and the cell lines that were produced from those um, were lost in a flood, unfortunately. So we weren't able to get that. Uh, and that would presume that the uh, replication profile would be the same for both those um, homozygous expanded alleles. So we weren't able to do that. But what we were able to do is we approached Genevieve Gordon, who you remember I told you has a mouse model of myotonic dystrophy where she's inserted <coughs> a very large human genomic region into the mouse, single copy integrant. And this mouse is a beautiful model of instability. It shows transmission expansions and tissue specific expansions, very much like what's occurring in patients. And she has this mouse model and this is 45 KB, hey, it's the same 45 KB that we were looking at in the humans. And we assessed all of our primer sets that John used and they amplify only the human transgene in the mouse and not the mouse genome. So this is very powerful for us to actually assess what's happening in different parts of this in vivo model. So let's look at what's happening. 
So again, the x-axis is the DMPK locus, and the y is the level of um, uh, nascent DNA. You can see we actually end up with a single peak of initiation. What does that look like relative to the human analysis? Well, that's shown above here, and we're looking at this region in the mouse, and you can see that the one peak that we're seeing is coincident with the peak that's occurring in humans. So it's only the downstream peak. That we're getting the same peak, and we've done other replication origins in these uh, um, mice, um, and shown that they're active, tells us that is, this is active, and it's this one, this one downstream origin that's actually active. And this is thymus tissue. So this is in vivo analysis of replication origins. If you want to know how we isolated the nascent DNA from tissues, ask me later, I'll tell you how we did that. Um, so this actually suggests that we're having one replication origin that's active, and that tells you that the repeat is going to be replicated in this direction. This was extremely satisfying for us because all of the model systems, and I'll tell you most of them out there, show contractions instead of expansions. The few that actually have seen expansions have always been replicated in this direction. They've never been replicated in the other direction. So this was satisfying for us to find that this is what's actually active in the expanded repeat in Genevieve's mice. So what about tissue specificity? Let's look at different tissues. I've already told you about thymus. What about pancreas, spermatogonia, or the brain, where we have variable levels of instability? So let's look at the replication and initiation profile there. So this is, again, my x-axis, my, my repeat, and my CCF binding sites. And this is the relative um, uh, um, abundance of nascent DNA over those various regions. And you can see we're having a single initiation site in the pancreas, a single initiation site in the thymus, and the pattern is relatively the same for the different uh, regions. In the testis, you see we have again a single initiation site, but we have uh, an asymmetric appearance of nascent DNA between the initiation site and the repeat for the testes. Uh, and for brain, um, we're seeing, again, the single initiation site, we're seeing, again, an overabundance of nascent DNA between the initiation site and the repeat itself in that tissue. So this tells you that we're actually seeing uh, breadths of change of initiation patterns in different tissues. So the profile of replication in different tissues varies. And this is all from tissues of the same mice. So it tells you that between tissues you're having differences. So what about the age effect. So remember, as people and mice age, the instability progresses. And it's been characterized very well by uh, Genevieve's lab that in her mice, at two weeks, the spermatogonia show no instability of the repeat. But at around seven weeks, um, and we chose eight weeks, instability begins to become detectable in the repeat track. And then at 24 weeks, there's high levels of robust expansions occurring. So let's look at replication profile in this single tissue over different time periods. And we'll choose these time periods, <coughs> 2, 8, and 24 weeks. So here is the profile for two weeks. And you can see we have the initiation site here. It's localized the same as in humans, the downstream origin. And we have an abundance of products here. At eight weeks, we have the same initiation. And we still have an abundance, but it's reduced relative to two weeks. And at 24 weeks, we have a similar pattern to what's occurring at uh, eight weeks. Um, so this tells you that there is a replication profile difference that is coincident with the time changes of instability in this given tissue. So there is some suggestion, at least in the testes, that there is a profile change. And that might actually support that profile change being related to instability. So one way of interpreting this is that we have replication origins that are changing their location between different tissues or between de different developmental stages. However, we don't favor this model because you'll remember all of our initiation sites in all of the tissues we looked at were the same. What it was is that was the breadth of initiation was changing between different tissues or different ages. And that might suggest that we're having uh, some sort of replication pause that's occurring. And that might vary between different ages or different tissues. So a question getting back to how does CTCF actually regulate instability, the data so far, and I'm not going to be able to show you it all, all to you, um, suggests that CTCF binding actually slows replication fork progression. Um, so 
most cases when people, and I swear I had this slide in before yesterday, Moral. <laughs> I didn't put it in because of yesterday. Um, <laughs> the data usually suggests, and people interpret, when you have a pause in replication fork, this is going to be bad. This is going to be mutagenic. This is not something you want to happen. But actually, the data suggests that when you have a pause in the replication fork ahead of a triplet repeat, it's actually a warning sign. Slow down. You're going to have an accident. You don't want to have an accident. You better slow down and proceed through that carefully. And the data so far suggests that CTCF is actually that sign telling you slow down. And I'll show you some of that data. So we wanted to see if there's actually pausing occurring at the myotonic dystrophy locus in a disease patient. So where we mapped the replication forks, uh, excuse me, origins in patient cells, we did this study. So what I'm showing you here is PCR amplification across the disease allele, which is around 250 repeats and the normal allele, which is 12 repeats. And we're doing small pool PCR, which is a very sensitive way to detect these alleles. And we're doing it in genomic DNA. And you can see that in almost all of these reactions, we're getting equal amplification levels of the disease allele to the non-effective allele. So if we look at nascent DNA, is there equal representation of the expanded versus the non-expanded allele? And in fact, we have an over-representation of the non-affected allele in the nascent DNA relative to the expanded allele. That tells you that replication fork progression is more easily accomplished through the non-expanded repeat than it is through the expanded repeat, suggesting that there might be a pause occurring at the expanded repeat. And that's shown graphically here. So this is in vivo suggestion for a pause occurring at the repeat track that's expanded. So there's one, to summarize, there's one replication origin that's replicating the expanded repeat. And that replication direction is defined with the unstable lengths. CTCF binding actually binds to protect against high levels of CTG CAG instability. And CTG binding actually enhances fork pausing or replication progression. Um, tissue specific and age dependent replication um, profiles actually change and vary with um, instability levels. And origin fork progression um, might actually modulate uh, this mutation. So what, what actually is changing between different tissues of different ages that's actually modulating this instability? So maybe it's actually DNA methylation. Um, and because we, we're thinking that uh, binding of CTCF or chromatin packaging can change with different methylation levels. So um, let's look at that. There are two other publications that have looked at DNA methylation. And they've looked at DNA methylation in myotonic dystrophy because there is a very, very severe form of, con uh, of myotonic dystrophy, it's called the congenital form. If you remember my pedigree at the beginning, I showed you the child. Children that are born with congenital form have very large expansions, and they have uh, developmental and mental uh, retardation, and they die very young. It's a very severe form of the disease, and people don't know why this is different. And people have hypothesized maybe it's methylation. And so the two studies included one from Peter Harper's group and another from Peter Steinbeck's group, and both of them observed uh, methylation that was far upstream of the repeat tract, but this occurred not specifically to patients or um, congenital uh, individuals. So it seems that everybody has this high level of, of methylation. Um, Peter Steinbeck's group found that there was um, hypermethylation that was proximal to the repeat, and he suggested that it was occurring in congenital individuals, and that was what the cause was for congenital myotonic dystrophy. Um, unfortunately, uh, that whole study was limited to just the leukocytes uh, of these individuals, and it wasn't very carefully done. It was done with restriction digestions, and it was limited to a single site, uh, which really indicates one CBG site. So what's actually happening? So Arturo Lopez, a uh, postdoctoral fellow in my group, asked the question of methylation, and he asked it with um, a methylation analysis by bisulfite um, sequencing. So where are we going to look? Well, this is a very large region to look, um, but we're mostly interested in um, the region that's right adjacent to the repeats. The other studies looked only upstream. We're going to look both downstream and upstream, focusing upon these regions that are very proximal to the repeat, including the CTCF binding sites. And that's going to be done by, by sulfite analysis and sequencing. Um, we looked at Genevieve Gordon's mice with 20 repeats, which is genetically stable, as well as with the expanded repeats. I'm not going to have time to tell you, that, uh, tell you about that data. I'll just give you the summary of it. 
but we also looked at uh, human samples. We looked at all of the fetuses as well as all of the adult tissues that I told you about early for the size analysis. Um, and so the questions we're asking is, does the myotonic dystrophy locus have aberrant DNA methylation? Is there tissue specificity for that pattern of methylation if it exists? And is there an age-dependent dynamics of this methylation? So I'll show you here, we're looking at a fetus that doesn't have myotonic dystrophy, and we're looking at different tissues shown here. And here's the repeat track, and we see some but very little amounts of methylation. The CTCF binding sites in all of my um, slides are shown in yellow. It's a very large binding site, 50 nucleotides long. So when we're looking at fetuses of various ages, and I'm only showing a few of the fetuses that we've looked at here, um, we see that there's high levels of methylation on the proximal side that's upstream, and virtually no methylation that is on the downstream side. This is actually quite a striking uh, polarization of methylation. Um, and there is some um, variation of methylation between different tissues, but predominantly there's high levels of methylation upstream. Now a question that comes up is, hey, you just told me that replication origins could vary between different alleles. What about your methylation? So Arturo and I, we designed a way to look at that, and this is a multiplex assay. Essentially we have three primers, um, and they can amplify across the repeat only when the repeat is not expanded. Because the repeat has 6,000, 4,000, 5,000 repeats, you're not able to PCR amplify across the repeat. You're only able to cross by, amplify across the short allele. So you're able to amplify with this one and this one, or this one and this one, giving rise to two products, which you can see here. When we restriction digest with a methyl-sensitive restriction enzyme, we find that we actually only end up with one allele. This is indicative of the normal allele. So this tells you that the methylation pattern we were seeing, which includes this region, is actually due only to the expanded allele. So the methylation pattern we are seeing is specific to the expanded allele. So there's proximal methylation. It's specific to the disease allele. It's only upstream. Is there an age-dependent dynamics? So here is shown adult patients and you can see that the adults, relative to what I showed you just a while ago for the fetuses, have far less methylation. And again, the methylation that is present is actually present only on one side and not downstream. So this tells you that there is a methylation change, and it's a loss of methylation. And the degree of loss of methylation appears to vary for different tissues. So you'll note that the cerebellum almost has no methylation in all of the adults that we saw. And the heart has some loss of methylation in some of these individuals relative to the high levels of methylation occurring in the fetuses. And I, I, what I'm doing here is I'm just showing you the upstream regions and you can compare the fetuses with the adults. And you can see just by looking at it that there is a loss of methylation and a lot of the loss is actually occurring over the CTCF sites which, which suggests that there is more binding of CTCF here than here possibly. So there's a loss of methylation with age, the loss of methylation is centered over the CTCF site. There are some tissues that are actually devoid of methylation, like the cerebellum. Some have actually lost methylation, um, like the kidney, the heart, and the muscle during aging processes. And some have not lost any methylation, for instance, the cortex. So how this uh, variable methylation actually contributes to disease and possibly gene expression is really not known, but that's something that we're very interested in looking at. But there seems to be some association of methylation loss with the instability. And the cerebellum, for instance, which shows the smallest expansion, is completely devoid of methylation. So that might suggest that the absence of methylation is associated with uh, the inability to expand. What we'd really like, unfortunately we don't have a sample, is to be able to look at the cerebellum in a fetal sample. Is it methylated? Because if it's methylated, the loss of methylation might be associated with protection against instability. If it's not methylated, then it's complete absence of methylation that's associated with the absence of instability. We don't have subsample. I'm looking still. So uh, methylation is actually Unlike what Peter Steinbeck says, it's not limited to congenital individuals. So all of the adult individuals still have some methylation, 
and that tells you that congenital myotonic dystrophy is not probably caused by aberrant methylation. What exactly is causing my, a congenital form of myotonic dystrophy is still an open question. So I told you I would summarize the mouse stuff. Essentially we see very similar pattern. We see methylation occurring only in the expanded allele, not in the non-expanded mice. Um, and the methylation is uh, predominantly <coughs> upstream, but we're also seeing it downstream in the mice. And there's tissue specificity to the degree of methylation. There's also a loss of methylation with aging of the mice. So there's similarity between the humans and the mouse model. So now I, I'm going to uh, hand wave a little bit, try and pull all together what I, what I <coughs> think we've got with the, all the data that our lab and others have put together. Uh, and this is a model that's open for argument and uh, possible development with new data. So what do we think we have? We have a model of tissue specific and age dependent instability. Modulation of DNA replication initiation and or fork progression possibly by epigenetics or uh, a methylation, CTCF binding, chromatin packaging can actually vary between different tissues different ages and affected and non-affected. And this alteration can actually give rise to different levels of instability. So with the replication data, what might, might we suggest? Well, we know we're having replication of the unstable allele from one replication origin. So here's our repeat, here are our CTCF binding sites. So we might have replication and that pause might occur because of CTCF binding. And that would be occurring with a degree of instability or an age or a specific tissue that are showing a degree of instability. During increased instability, you might have less CTCF binding and reduced amount of pausing, give rise to slippage of, uh, of the repeat sequences and giving rise to increased levels of instability. And when you have higher levels of instability or tissues with higher levels of instability, you have uh, almost complete loss of binding of CTCF and no pausing occurring giving rise to great levels of instability. Again, this is a, a model based upon what we've found so far, uh, and it's open for discussion. So we would suggest that instead of uh, a pause of replication giving rise to an accident, it's actually a warning telling you to actually slow things down and avoid a mutation. So I've told you about repeat diseases and how they're important targets. Uh, the instability itself is an important target for therapy. I told you a little bit about where, looking at different tissues, and I told you a little bit about when, looking at developmental times, and I told you a little bit about how, focusing upon replication and DNA repair, and I told you a little bit about what, uh, focusing upon MSH3 and CTCF, and uh, we should also have CPG methylation in there. Um, and so, again, I remind you, this is a progress. We're not there yet, but we're on our way towards trying to obtain some sort of therapeutic treatment for patients with this disease. And I'd like to take some time to thank you for your attention and your patience. And I'd like to thank all the wonderful collaborators who have uh, worked so well with us, including all the patients who have uh, provided uh, samples to us uh, and the funding agencies. And so I'll take questions now. <laughs>